So um, welcome uh, all to uh, a special panel. This is supported by the Chan Zuckerberg uh, Institute, which uh, was also a, a, a sponsor uh, of attendance at the meeting. And uh, one of the outstanding features of the meeting for me, and I think for many of us, was the dedicated effect to make the meeting as inclusive as it could possibly be and to make a kind of a uh, lemonade out of lemons event uh, such that because we had to have a virtual meeting, we could reimagine the meeting and the uh, heroic figures around that process were Aaron who brought up the idea and David who welcomed it and expanded it and worked with it with his team. And uh, it, I think, has been incredibly gratifying. So uh, we're, we're, we're grateful to Chan Zuckerberg and we're grateful to uh, the, the people that sparked and developed the idea and everybody who attended and, and participated. It's been, it's been great. Having said that, uh, most of us, I think, are going to remember this year as the year of the COVID. And they may throw in a bunch of uh, sketchy adjectives as well. It's been a uh, unforgettable and extremely challenging, difficult, and every other word you can think of year. As scientists, we deal with complexity, difficulty, and challenges all the time. And so when I was asked by David to put together a panel discussion of something that was topical and would be of broad interest and worth talking about, I couldn't think of anything better than COVID. And I can't think of anybody to lead off the talk better or the panel better uh, than Walter Koroshetz uh, from NINDS, who has not only uh, led the NINDS, but has also been a consistent champion on social media, believe it or not. Uh, uh, one of the few gray hairs who's taken on social media and made that a way of inspiring and sustaining the community. So the plan is to have four different presentations. Walter's going to tell us about the NINDS. Sandra is going to tell us about running a lab in these times. And we know from her presentation that she's doing it damn well and keeping it going. And we want to know how. Anna is going to tell us what it's been like to practice neurology. When it all comes down to it, the neuroscience we do is in many ways largely aimed at understanding neurological disease. And so Anna has experienced taking care of people either with COVID disease or with other neurological conditions during a time of pandemic, really unique, uh, I think in all of our lives. And Aaron is gonna talk to us about scientific meetings and the challenges and the opportunities around this period of time. Walter's time with us is limited. So we're gonna hear all the four talks, which are gonna be short and I think mostly without slides. And then we're gonna have a question and answer session that is meant to go on for quite some time until the end of the uh, hour and a half that we have together. And so we're gonna focus on Walter's questions as long as we've got him after the presentation. So, Walter. Great. Well, <clears throat> thanks, Richard. Uh, happy to be here. And I, I was really impressed by the science that was presented. I was off and on yesterday. And, um, you know, it's clear that we're making headway. You can't, as, as was mentioned, you can't predict where the headway is going to be made, but you know there's going to be headway. And um, so hats off to the scientists and, and the people in the labs who have, you know, been pushing the science forward. And, you know, clearly COVID has, you know, been a major problem for the science. Uh, the labs closed, 
they reopened. Now we're having more trouble again. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's a, there's a price to pay, unfortunately. I'm not sure how we're going to pay that price, but uh, some of it's just the emotional price on the young people. And that's what we're most worried about is that people, you know, when they're early in their career and they want to get things moving, this has really been a period where they can't move their science. And so we're very uh, worried that people are going to start dropping out. And so I think that's our biggest worry. And <clears throat> I don't know exactly know how you can help them. You can't bring them in the lab and crowd them in again and get them doing experiments. Uh, but, you know, there, as you know, there are ways in which you can engage people and try and keep their keep their passion going. And that's really what the mentors are re really all about. So I think we have to rely on really good mentorship to bridge this gap with the young people. We've done some things. So if there are people with uh, fellowships or K awards where they are caught in a transition, we'll extend the payment for those uh, awards, um, uh, you know, until this thing is over and they can move, move forward. Uh, there's also been a big price to pay in terms of resources that were lost um, and, um, and, you know, animal colonies that had to be culled. Uh, all the clinical research was stopped. And, you know, the clinical research has, you know, the, the goal is to enroll X number of patients and not going to be able to do that in the time frames. So the bill is going to come when those things are supposed to end and they'll have to be extended with funds. So we, we, of course, did not cut off anybody's funds during this period of time because um, we didn't want to lose the workforce. And, um, but, you know, it's, there's going to be a price to be paid there as well. Now, there are bills, in, or there, there are bills uh, that came out of the House, the Supplement Bill and the Senate Bill, which actually had funds that were, were going to go to NIH and then go out to the universities to kind of make up for these things. Um, but so far, none of those bills have moved at all. It's not clear they're ever going to move. Um, and uh, so, I mean, we have to do the best with what we can, and we will certainly, you know, take money away from X to, to if we have a, an emergency situation, um, in, you know, with people, especially the trainees. Uh, <clears throat> the other emergency is we actually have COVID is a problem and it's not like it's not getting into the nervous system. It's a, so the more we know about this, the more worried we should be getting. Um, so when people get COVID, you know, they don't get worked up for what's going on in their brain because nobody wants to put them in an MR machine and, and, or, you know, a CT scan or anything. So the workups have been pretty minimal. Um, but uh, there are a couple of pathology studies that are coming out and, and they are showing the fact that this virus is affecting uh, both definitely anatomically affecting the brain. You can see uh, areas where uh, there's blood-brain breakdown. And so things like fibrinogen, thrombin are moving into the nervous system, into the neuropil, which is not good for the neuropil. And, uh, and then sometimes followed by inflammatory cells. Um, the, the consequences, so in the short term, there's quite a bit of issues that occur. People not uncommonly will present with delirium. So they don't have a diagnosis of COVID. They just become delirious, they take it to the emergency room, they're found to have COVID. So clearly COVID is doing something in the nervous system. That's pretty dramatic uh, abnormality. There's people who've gone into status, there's seizures, there is a prothrombotic condition that occurs in COVID that leads to stroke. Now, initially it was these big strokes, large artery, you know, middle several artery occlusions, basal artery occlusions. Um, but in the past studies, what you see is you see little occlusions, lots of places, uh, sometimes with little hemorrhages. Um, and we know the virus uh, does, you know, have this receptive ACE receptor on the endothelial cells. And, uh, and there are some very weird, weird neurological manifestations. Um, the one, one is that, you know, people become hypoxic and they don't feel short of breath and they're not hyperventilating which is crazy. If you go, you know, to, from Boston to, you know, Denver, you're short of breath because the oxygen tension is lower. 
but there's something wrong with the oxygen sensing, whether it's at the carotid bulb or in the hypothalamus or in the hypothalamus medulla, not quite clear yet. But those seem to be areas where people have seen some of the pathology in the in the in the people have died. Um, and then there's another weird thing. I, it's not really in the literature, but I, I've talked to many people about it. That uh, the people who have COVID, the dose of anesthetics that they need to keep them down and uh, comfortable are off the charts. Uh, so it's almost as though they have a resistance to anesthetics. And this is many different forms of anesthetics. They use primarily propofol and benzodiazepam, which is, you know, as a GABA agonist. Um, but there's something peculiar about them in the hospital. Um, and then, and, and so we know it's affecting the nervous system in, in, in the people who are sick. Now, um, the bigger problem is the people who are sick get COVID, they get rid of the virus, but they're not better. And so we'll, people call this differently. We're trying to call it the post-acute COVID syndrome. Um, but the defining feature of these people is, is fatigue, overwhelming fatigue. So we've all felt fatigue. We got sick. We feel fatigue. We can't do anything. I can't run anymore. Pretty hard to read a, 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 you know, a, an intense paper when I'm fatigued and have a flu or something. Um, but there are people who develop what's called chronic fatigue and they never lose that, oftentimes after an infection. And so the data now from the CDC, there's a study where they looked at people a couple of weeks after uh, COVID and um, 90, if it was the flu, you'd expect 90% of the people to be better. Here, it's only about 50% of the people are better. And fatigue is the overwhelming problem. Um, and then they complain in the hospital and then outside the hospital of trouble with memory, concentration. Um, it goes by the name of brain fog, if you see it in the newspapers. So, you know, this is clearly a cognitive abnormality that people are experiencing. And it's, it's people from, you know, all walks of life. Um, you hear it probably most vociferously from doctors and professors. Um, and uh, then there's pain syndromes, uh, sleep disorders. One doc said the patients tell him that it's like they forgot how to sleep. Um, so sleep disorders are probably important. Um, and then there's this very strange um, paroxysmal tachycardia that occurs in people where their hearts will start racing. Um, and it's a little similar to the postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, which again has been a tough one to get at the bottom of. Um, but it's a known event and you could diagnose this uh, on a tilt table and you tilt somebody up and their heart rate goes off the roof. Um, and this is also very common in people with chronic fatigue syndrome. Mm -hmm. So, um, so the, the studies are still pretty rudimentary, but um, some of them are out to about six months and oh, I'm sorry, some of them are out to about six or seven weeks. And they all seem to have the same constellation. So I think it's a real thing. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the nervous system is, you know, something that's really going to, we're going to have to understand that. Now, the other area which comes in, as one might imagine, with a stressor like this is psychiatric disorders. And so uh, anxiety and depression are very common in, in this population, not well quantified yet. Um, but but it, a real problem. There was a paper um, that was done on electronic health records of like 25,000 people, and they compared new diagnoses um, after COVID with new diagnoses after flu and a couple of other conditions. And so depression is much higher after COVID than you would expect. Mm -hmm. uh, anxiety is, insomnia is, but also dementia diagnoses. So yeah. Dementia diagnoses were one of the biggest effect sizes. Now, it could be that you know, someone who has underlying dementia, they get sick and they're, you know, they found to have real trouble and so first recognized there, but they're using the flu as a kind of a control. Maybe it's not the best, but you would have to, I mean, you would have to wonder given what we know about neurodegeneration 
and the role of uh, the immune, innate immune, and maybe even systemic immune response, that uh, this is something we might have to worry about, that the, um, the, this immune challenge that comes with COVID and the immune response that comes with COVID may have effects on neurodegeneration. And that's something I think we're gonna have, have surveillance going out uh, to understand. Uh, uh, Walter, I yeah. just, I'm gonna make, I, I may need to make a mid-course correction. Do we have you until 2.30 or until two? I know you have another competing or I another think, you know, um You know, I'm gonna have to ask, I, you know, the, the three o'clock I did a Zoom recording, so I may not have to be there. <laughs> Okay. They have me till 2.30. I'm going to double check that I'm not supposed to do anything Very live. <laughs> okay. That's the epilepsy meetings are also going on today. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so that's a fantastic way to kick us off. Thank you. Integration sure. of trouble and new, new emerging syndromes uh, that we have to sort out and they teach us about other things as well. I want to encourage the audience, which is now getting pretty big, um, this is all about Q&A, so let's light up the Q&A uh, feature on your Zoom uh, with questions. I'm sure that Walter's comments have provoked some questions uh, and, and probably uh, will be nicely complementary with what Anna's going to tell us about. Um, so maybe Anna, if you if it's okay with you, you would go next because I think it's a nice uh, sequela. Uh, Anna's coming to us from Columbia uh, and has been a clinical neurologist practicing during this time. Hi hey, Anna. Hi. So thank you, Rich, uh, for inviting me here as well as Scott and the entire Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory for this invitation. Uh, also, I want to thank Richard Mayu for his support and my mentors, Karen Martyr, Mitch Elkind, and particularly Jamie Noble. So I want to focus in on two aspects. Uh, first, the practice of general inpatient neurology during deployment, very different from normal practice, and drawing upon my experiences in our large COVID-19 transformed city hospital, including one case that eventually had autopsy findings potentially relevant to neurodegeneration. And second, I'll discuss the potential mechanistic connection between COVID-19 acute and post-infectious states and neurodegeneration. In addressing the second part, I want to review potential mechanisms of neurodegeneration relying on pre-COVID and early COVID-19 studies. I want to suggest the characterization of post-COVID brain fog from the perspective of a cognitive and behavioral neurologist. And third, propose that post-COVID brain fog may be a model for studying possible links to neurodegeneration, in part by using the very techniques discussed here at this conference over the past few days. In March and May, to May of 2020, New York City, not the first COVID hub in the US, quickly became the largest. New York City had over 200,000 cases in that time and 17,000 deaths in just three harrowing months. 23% knew someone who had died from the virus. Studying prior coronaviruses and estimating r naughts in January and February, we realized that the sheer scale of COVID-19 would be a call to action. All human coronaviruses cause neurological complications. The four common cold coronaviruses, despite their diffuse spread in society, have only rare neurological manifestations. On the other hand, the more severe coronaviruses, SARS and MERS, affected much smaller segments of the population. Therefore, the absolute numbers to study uh, were far smaller still. Yet we knew that ne with nearly 90% phylogenetic similarity to SARS and 50% to MERS, this coronavirus had the potential to cause what was seen in those, namely encephalopathy, seizure, ischemic stroke, intracerebral hemorrhage, polyneuropathy, and myopathy in elderly as well as young adults. But what was the mechanism? As we described in a neurology clinical practice review and referencing as well a Queen's Square report in brain, initial reports of COVID-19 neurological and psychiatric complications mainly included hospitalized and often critically ill patients and described severe neurological outcomes similar to, but even broader than those seen in SARS or MERS. 
uh, and um, as Dr. Korshitz has mentioned, encephalopathy, albeit largely after suffering acute respiratory distress syndrome in that initial cohort, sometimes with acute psychosis, also stroke of diverse mechanisms, often associated with prothrombotic state, seizure, Guillain-Barre and Miller-Fisher syndromes, syncope ataxia, frequent microhemorrhages, perhaps related to endothelial dysfunction, um, related to viral binding to the ACE2 enzymes expressed on endothelial cells, and also neurogenic respiratory failure, a lot of dysautonomia, demyelination, acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, and a few reports of a possible encephalitis, uh, often in previously immunocompromised patients. But also less debilitating symptoms were, were reported in much higher frequencies, including olfactory and gustatory dysfunction, fatigue, myalgias, headache, anorexia, dizziness, and sensory changes. Personally, I had never ordered so many C-reactive proteins, let alone interleukin 6s. Could the inflammatory changes be an explanation for the involvement of the nervous system? One patient, who we subsequently reported in Acta Neuropathologica, exemplified this high level of acuity. A 72-year-old man with few comorbidities arrived in the hospital already intubated, after a sudden onset of vomiting and loss of consciousness with no history of respiratory symptoms. I asked for a stat head CT and a COVID-19 PCR. The head CT showed a large cerebellar hemorrhage with herniation. The PCR was positive. He was deemed to be inoperable. The connection between his hemorrhage and COVID-19 was there, but it was unclear. Yet the clinical pace was unrelenting it was on to the next severe neuro neurological finding, once again to question whether an act of COVID-19 infection could have contributed to it. And then, months later, the neuropathology resulted. The surprising finding was localized microglial nodules and neuronophagia, byproducts of microglial activation. I reconfirmed with his family. He had not had COVID-19 symptoms. In fact, he had been perfectly well and riding the subway on errands that very day. And with the little time he had spent intubated, just hours, the microglial activation was less likely to be explained by prolonged hypoxia. Our larger manuscript is in preparation, uh, but microglial activation on COVID-19 autopsy has been also reported in at least four other neuropathology groups, in the brainstem, the olfactory bulb, and diffusely throughout the cortex at times. Whereas mild focal perivascular, parenchymal, and leptomeningeal T-cell predominant lymphocytic infiltrates were identified in numerous cases without clear evidence of vasculitis or meningoencephalitis. Even if viral RNA exists or persists in the CNS, there is very little evidence for COVID-19 causing frequent encephalitis. Encephalopathy is a whole nother story. Over the past few months, more reports have emerged focusing on encephalopathy as a presenting and highly prevalent symptom of acute COVID-19 infection. And this was in line with what I was seeing anecdotally. Um, perhaps the strained resources that we all had in treating patients forced us to triage history taking and documentations to the symptoms that we knew to look for on admission and also on discharge and follow-up. Yet the crumbs of clues were left over from the original SARS. Here's what we knew. After SARS, long-term effects were reported, but study methods were not robust. For example, SARS SARS survivors from a Hong Kong hospital responded to a survey 41 months after recovery. Over 40% had active psychiatric illness, 40% complained of chronic fatigue, and 27% met criteria for, for chronic fatigue syndrome. In another small study of 22 SARS survivors who were unable to work mainly as healthcare workers, symptoms closely overlapped with chronic fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, pain, weakness, depression, and sleep disturbance. For now, we, at least in New York City, have perhaps temporarily emerged from the crucible of inpatient neurological manifestations during COVID-19 and can focus on COVID-19 survivors. Those who study post-infectious syndromes like ME-CFS have woefully expected the findings that I'm about to relate to you. In addition to the many post-intensive care syndrome patients, there are and I can attest to that, COVID-19 survivors who only suffered mild to moderate infection and are now presenting weeks to more than half a year after the acute infection with encephalopathy. This is otherwise known as post-COVID cognitive concerns, post-COVID brain fog. It is a subset of long COVID, 
But although it is increasingly reported, it remains a poorly defined clinical and biochemical state. Many of us have repurposed our trade to study COVID-19. Myself, as a cognitive and behavioral neurology fellow, I have approached brain fog by starting with a cognitive neurological workup. We focus on the people who have prominent new cognitive symptoms affecting their daily lives. The other many symptoms are supportive. Together with Dr. Jamie Noble, we have seen over 20 patients with impaired short-term memory, executive fun function loss, and or processing speed problems, uh, a lot of inattention, along with other domains that could and very well may have cortical, subcortical, brain and brain stem origins or impact, such as mood, including all comer psychiatric illness, anxiety and depression, behavior, including ADHD type symptoms, irritability, fatigue, especially post-exertional uh, um, exercise and physical and mental fatigue, balance, dysautonomia, uh, including palpitations and orthostatic lightheadedness, headache, sleep, smell and taste problems, hormonal status, neuropathy, shortness of breath despite normal cardiac function, and diffuse aches, as well as recurrent inflammatory symptoms and urination changes. Others are also finding that some COVID patients have transient increases in autoantibodies after infection. The autopsy work that I told you about earlier seems persistently relevant. Could the, could the recent findings of microglial activation from those who succumbed to COVID-19 suggest an etiology for those who survived but are now plagued? Was this a neuroimmunological response out of proportion to the degree of hypoxia, stroke, or hemorrhage initially suffered? Because perhaps dysfunctional astrocytes fail to defend the blood-brain barrier against invading cytokines and chemokines. As we described in a review for NPJ in Nature Parkinson's disease with Dave Seltzer, if activated microglia and T cells and other proposed mechanisms such as changes in bioenergetics lead to potential mitochondrial dysfunction, proteostasis disturbance, autophagy dysfunction, endoplasmic reticulum stress and autoantigens, SARS-CoV-2 infection, like some other known viral infections, may prompt protein misfolding and aggregation. An important question is whether post-COVID brain fog is a non-consequential transient state or instead a transient warning sign of higher susceptibility to neurodegeneration or perhaps even an independent contributor to neurodegeneration, maybe even a protective and clearance mechanism. Meanwhile, at our ADRC at Columbia University, we are studying blood biomarkers of neurodegeneration, namely PTEL-181 and NFL and in acutely ill COVID-19 patient plasma, also in those with post-COVID brain fog just starting. A recent observational study and limited case reports detected increased CSF and or plasma levels of GFAP, NFL, tau, and several inflammatory markers in COVID-19. If post-COVID-19 brain fog is also associated with neurodegenerative markers, it could suggest ongoing neuronal injury. And I will add, the study of microglial activation has already taught us about a possible pathway between neuroimmunological activity and downstream neurodegeneration, as distinguished speakers like Ann Schaefer and the bonn Henneke Lab have explained during this conference. Technologies such as integrated single cell analysis of blood and CSF have been studied in other neuroimmunological diseases to show compartmentalized mechanisms driving human autoimmunity in the brain. We hypothesis that this post-viral syndrome is associated with a heightened state of CNS immune activation that can be characterized and measured. Inflammation due to pre-infection immunosenescence may also be a risk factor for post-COVID encephalopathy. So to conclude, understanding this connection may lead to precision medicine, immunomodulatory and other treatments for post-COVID brain fog, as well as other post-infectious syndromes, and open a window into the infectious and neuroimmune hypotheses of neurodegeneration. Thank you. Superb. Thank you very much, Anna. Uh, we'll now move on to Sandra, who's going to talk to us about being a lab chief in the, in the time of COVID and uh, what you can do to keep things going so we can look into some of these problems. Yeah, thank you, Richard, and thank you, um, Aaron, Scott, and Walter, and all the organizers for, for um, calling upon 
just our experience, you know, and that's, that's really, uh, you know, we're all going through this. So, uh, you know, I, the point here that I'd like to make is just to throw out some uh, bullet points that will promote a little bit of discussion um, since we all have um, are living through this right now. But, you know, just to put my two cents on, like I said, um, a few things that perhaps um, we can stimulate discussion at the end uh, of the session. So, you know, as you know, from uh, those who were able to attend the morning session, my lab is interested in you know, the cell biology of neurons and the role that this, this endolysosomal pathways are um, now, um, it's very clear, are playing in, in, in specifically in our case, so we're interested in, in the formation of intracellular inclusions um, of misfolded proteins that are involved in neurogeneration. And, and for this, the requirements that our lab uh, has are not too different from many labs, of course. We just, we, you know, we have mouse models, so we have a, 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 a vivarium colony. Um, uh, we do tissue culture work. We're very microscopy intensive, so we have those things um, that, that we need. And what I want to do just in the next few minutes is just to tell you a little bit how that has been impacted. Um, through you know the last eight months or so of, of uh, closing operations and so forth, um, uh, the the impactfulness of um, of COVID, um, I, I want to highlight uh, some of the of course the very difficult challenges that this has brought up um, in in both managing a lab as well as what I have experienced. Um, my group members have uh, undergone. Um, but also I'd like to highlight some of the things that we can um, maybe learn from this experience as we're living through this and perhaps even call it some of the pros of having uh, to experience this difficult, challenging time. So I just want to throw out a few things that, that at least in my experience, um, have uh, provided me with perspective as to maybe how to move forward and how to change things um, from, from usual um, ways of, of doing science as, as we had been doing until uh, last March. And then just to finish up, I'd like to um, highlight, you know, how this, this uh, talking about the impact of professional, of COVID to our professional lives, it is, it's uh, in, in, intrinsically linked to how it has impacted our personal lives. And so this, this cannot be dissociated, in my opinion, and has to be as, as mentors and as mentees, has, has to be taken into account uh, jointly and together um, to assess where we have come until now, we're still through this. And also importantly, once we get out of the situation to look back on it and, and follow up actually uh, with some things that I think will be important to, to look after um, and to keep in mind as we move forward through this, through this, um, through this stage um, of affairs. Um, so, so in terms of the impact that, of course, this this um, uh, COVID and lockdown has had, there, there's uh, things from general everyday operations, of course, that everybody has been impacted by, uh, the closing of the labs, and just in our case, you know, at Scripps, um, uh, we're at Scripps here in La Jolla, and. Um, I think that they, you know, we closed down as everybody did for uh, over two months, uh, and that entailed a lot of calling of our mouse colonies, which, you know, eventually took a while to to come back up. So obviously, general daily operations were shut down for for good for for a long time. Um, uh, when we came back up, we came back up in different stages, and so we came back up, you know, uh, half time uh, with restricted schedules. We eventually came back up more full time, but also with very restrictive schedules and shifts for everyone. Um, so obviously that's you know something that everybody, like I said, is going through and that obviously impacted our work. Uh, the, the obvious uh, hard thing in, from a mentor perspective um, is, is uh, the difficulty in holding a direct mentorship and supervising um, uh, of especially new new trainees and new new students and new um, postdocs, uh, this makes it of course very very difficult. I, I tend to think that I had an open door policy where um, you know at any time I could go and people could come in and and we can discuss science and this really, um, uh, as everybody knows, 
uh, really promotes discovery. And, and so this, of course, has been uh, relegated now to a screen. And so uh, alongside with, with that goes a, a very high increase of online fatigue, I call it. Uh, even when you don't have COVID, you're totally fatigued with online uh, uh, um, interactions, uh, which go beyond just looking at a screen. Of course, the, the sociological uh, impact of that on, on, on all of us, I think it's, it's um, and on our science is, is I think important to note, uh, and, and we all have gone through it. Uh, interestingly, you know, the impact, uh, you know, people, I think we try to overcompensate or compensate for things. And so instead of having less meetings, now we have more meetings online. So this is kind of an interesting byproduct, which, which given everything else that, that is happening, less childcare and all that, it makes it for a very uh, interestingly uh, challenge that we ourselves are trying, you know, have put on ourselves, I think. Um, so saying no has been actually a very important thing for me. You know, I can only make this one meeting once a month, not every week kind of thing, you know. So that's, uh, you know, the everyday general operations, of course, that's an impact. You know, the, the decreased productivity, of course, goes alongside with this, um, uh, not just because we closed completely for two months, but then just ramping up things takes time, um, it, it, physically, but mentally. Uh, you know, to go back to where we were before we shut down things, uh, it, it takes, it, you know, this ramping up period. So the productivity, if, if, you know, I'm sure people are maybe doing studies, I haven't really read them, but um, it's, it's an extended, sustained lack of productivity, I think, even when we came back to work. Um, and so, and this is all within the context of still having somehow expectations and living under the expectations of sustained output. Right, and, and at least how we think of ourselves to maintaining that sustained output and productivity, and yet the reality of it is, is, is decreased. Um, so another impact, of course, is the financial implications of, of, of what has happened in terms of actually the amount of funding that we have lost uh, on you know, an individual basis. Our, our, our lab is small, um, uh, but you know, having two months of no productivity and still having to pay people and still having to maintain somehow some level of operations means a, a negative, right? And so that is actually within the framework of um, uh, uh, losing that that money basically in the, with that productivity that's lost without the opportunity of a recovery plan, right? Or maybe a stimulus package <laughs> from NIH or something, right? Which we, as we heard from, uh, from Walter, we haven't, um, we haven't heard of, and, and you know, it's, it's not sure that, that it, it will ever happen. So these are very real implications that, you know, and, and in our lab, you know, we, we've made do, we're a small lab, so we are able to, to still interact and maintain uh, things, you know, just on an anecdote basis, as many of you uh, are, are having experiences with. So in that regard, I don't expect that we would be any different, um, but it is, it is, uh, uh, it has been an important, uh, it, it, and I think one of the, the, the big challenges has been, you know, getting people to maintain the level of relatedness um, socially as well as scientifically. And that I think to me has been the hardest thing to observe and to live through. Uh, on a personal level, um, just on a daily level with lab operations, right? Uh, so some of the, the things that, that I wanna highlight now is also what, what can we learn from this process, right? So it's, it's challenging and that you all know that. And you know, it, one of the things that at least I've gone through and that has, this has made me really, really think about is, and to get, gain the perspective is that to, to, to be more effective at our organization at different levels. Right, I, I have no choice really. And so I've been sort of thrown into having to do this differently um, and to adapt, right? And so it's been just a really long and hard adaptation period uh, and we're still going through that. But I think that there's that process that we normally have, you know, we probably are undergoing still and it will take a while to still be adapting to the situation and trying to make it work, right? So this is process of adaptation for us, for me, it has entailed reorganization of priorities and of um, at all different levels. And, uh, and you know, the meetings that 
uh, we have and, and some um, as a result have been more productive. Uh, and you know, uh, and, and maybe I can envision that some meetings will never be in person again. Uh, so this this kind of brings up the idea that maybe we can be translating our adaptations to a more broad spectrum, you know, and start thinking of sort of the delocalization of science, right? And so this idea that now is very ingrained in us, the ability to reach out to anybody, right, um, has really uh, brought very clearly the ability, I mean, we could do it always, but today is just so ingrained in our way of doing interactions that it's, um, I guess I posit that it, it can be a broad, um, in, you know, almost uh, institutionalized idea that we can reach out for collaborations that uh, in a much more effortless way than, than before. And this would be sort of a more ingrained uh, motivation that we have as a result of this. So perhaps these are some, some of the things that, you know, uh, I've gained as a perspective a little bit uh, on uh, through this, this that we can perhaps take with us, you know? So, so moving forward, you know, how, how do we move forward Sandra, from here? I, yeah. Sandra, sorry. I do want to, I want to try to catch Walter while we've got yes, of course. It, until 2.30. So yeah. I, I want to thank you for your comments. I think it's really wonderful, uh, illustrates sort of what a scientist is all about to try to find the, the silver lining and what might go forward that's better. Um, and we'll come back uh, to you, Aaron, if you'll hold off for now, we'll take a few questions um, and then you can present and then we'll take some more questions. Hey, Richard, uh, Jackie told me I'm good. So I don't, don't change things for me. I can stay on. Oh, okay, <laughs> all right. I did my talk right. virtually already. Thank you, to ja thank you to Jackie and thanks to virtuality. Um, Okay, uh, Sandra, let me come back to you then. A couple more, unless you're done, a couple more comments. And Yeah, no, I was just uh, wanted to wrap up by saying, you know, that all these, the, 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 the impactfulness of COVID it cannot be, it, to, to our professional lives and career, cannot be really measured only within the context of, of that, of the, of, the, of the lab. I think that looking at the relationship between personal and professional, uh, impact um, has to be really clear in, 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 in our minds, I think, as, as mentors for sure, but also as a perspective for our, our mentees, you know, uh, students, postdocs for, for everyone, because these two things are, are, are related very closely. And so I, I would, you know, the, the measure of impact um, to our everyday operations in the lab is ultimately. Um, directly tied to the measure in which our personal and social bubbles are impacted, right? And so I, I think that that's uh, the thing that I just wanted to part with is to keep an eye on those things, you know, our physical and our mental well-being. Uh, it's, it's, it, this is gonna leave a, a big print on us uh, in many ways and in our labs and in the socialness of our labs and to maintain and to reestablish those social relationships is gonna take some momentum, I think. Uh, in, in some ways. Um, and, and so in the importance of establishing this mentorship, mentee relationships, uh, I, I would think could help in that regard of reestablishing, you know, going back to this social uh, world that we hopefully will come back out of this, out of this, out of this time. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Aaron, I think that's a good transition to you in the, in the sense that uh, you've made something, I think, quite special out of the virtual world. And so the floor is yours. Thanks, Richard. Uh, mine will be brief. So mine was sort of an accident. So in April, when we're all, I, I really um, appreciate what Sandra said about need for social interaction. I think um, that's been the toughest part of this is um, we miss the day-to-day -day interactions with um, our lab mates who we, um, who we spend much of our life with. And um, back in April and March, um, just sort of to, um, because I was bored at home, I wanted to talk about science with a few friends. I just opened up a Zoom room and invited a couple people and I thought maybe no one would come. And then the first day 500 people showed up to hear the Zoom talk. 
And that was just the limit of how many can get in. And people were saying they couldn't get in. And then I asked um, Stanford if I can ha have more than 500 and they said no. So then I started streaming them to uh, YouTube and um, we called this uh, uh, NeuroZoom and um, just every Monday, uh, then I uh, paid uh, $31 to get a web page, just neurozoom.bio. And I just made this myself um, with just a list of different speakers, the Zoom link, anyone can go to it. And um, it, it's, it's Mondays at 5 p.m. Pacific time, that's 8 p.m. Eastern time. And it also, one key thing is um, I did this in collaboration with my colleagues in China to try to bring together investigators from Asia and, um, and the United States. And um, this has been um, really the highlight of my week, um, being able to do this. This is the one that's coming up on Monday. We have uh, really exciting speakers. We have a postdoc from Alice Ting's lab and we have uh, Feng Zhang, uh, world leader, pioneer in CRISPR. So, um, giving two, two talks and uh, so these, this is gonna be great. Um, and um, we've just been exploring different ways of advertising it. Um, I even tried a little bit to um, make these um, TikTok dances to advertise uh, these things. And like that, I've, I've stopped doing that but these have been um, fun to do and you can sort of see, um, see those if, if you want. Sorry about that. Okay, so um, so then so that's so that's been that's been really popular, and um, it's been really um, great because um, we've been doing it for about eight months, and even though um, the events around the world have been really tumultuous, and we've been reminded at times, especially here in America, of deep. Uh, deep-seated social and economic problems whose time of reckoning has come. Uh, for me personally, being able to tune in for one hour each week to NeuroZoom has really made uh, my heart sore. And um, I think it's it's not just the science, but it's being able to um, virtually sit next to students, postdocs, even famous scientists from around the world has been deeply rewarding. Uh, one just point is we intentionally made this meet, neuro zoom meeting a zoom meeting rather than a zoom webinar and i think there was just something about everyone being on the same level playing field equal not a panelist or an attendee that kind of makes the difference um, we all know that science and the pursuit of truth is the light in a time of darkness um, earlier in the summer um, i was really saddened when there were efforts uh, by the u.s government to curtail uh, j1 and h1b visas um, trying to close doors to scholars from around the world. Um, I felt this was xenophobic at its core. It's obviously short-sighted and cruel. Um, we all know that science is and ought to be an international endeavor. So we certainly need more bridges and fewer walls. And so although um, this NeuroZoom just started as a way to hear some science, talk, science talks with a few friends, I think our job now with NeuroZoom is um, as important than ever we have to show the world the power of collaborative international scientific discourse. Um, so I'm optimistic that um, here in the United States, the new incoming administration will return to a tradition of leadership that values and welcomes immigrants, not just because it's the right thing to do, but um, obviously our diversity is what makes us stronger and our science better. And the other thing I learned is that anyone could do this. Um, anyone can open up a Zoom room and invite people and advertise it to the world. And they're, um, so I hope that others take this idea and see how easy it is to stay connected. So perhaps that's one positive is that it's shown us that we can uh, stay connected even when we're physically distanced. Um, that's all I have to say. Good, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Um, I highly I'm, recommend the Zoom meetings. They were a lot of fun. Uh, and yes, we have, we have one chat to everybody, which is not a question, it's just, from Alfonso Martin Pena. The lineup of speakers on NeuroZoom has been terrific. Three exclamation points. Thank you. With two exclamation points. So I think you've really done something. Uh, I, I don't know if others have done it, but I know you've done it very well. And I've kept an eye on the lineup of speakers. It's unbelievable. And so, so Aaron, far, no one said no. And any, no one said no that I've asked. And um, 
anyone and other people have asked to give talks and they've given talk everyone's given talks so it's um it's been great yeah um, i just want to also add that the quality of the talks on your zoom um is really superb thank you leeway and i've also learned that like i think a 20 minute talk is the right time it's hard to stay focused for a hour talk so 20 minutes seems about right that but that's just my experience well, it's uh, you're to be congratulated and thanked. Um, I want to follow up on just one thing. You say, are these do these remain available on YouTube? Um, I have I've streamed the I stream them live through Zoom, and um, but then I delete them after a few days just to keep the next next one. So I'm not at all tech savvy, despite the TikTok channel. And I just use like my son's has a YouTube channel where he talks about tortoises. And I just use that as a home to put uh, these, um, these the stream live streaming ones, but um, I haven't kept them there. Okay, thanks. Uh, I, so I wanna take um, uh, chairman's prerogative and ask uh, Walter and, and Anna, um, you both emphasize the impact of, of uh, COVID-19 disease on the brain. One of the sort of sentinel symptoms that people have talked about widely is loss of olfaction and, and taste. Um, but that it didn't come up as a major topic. I think, Anna, you mentioned it as a symptom, but not as a I guess a, 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 a entree into mechanistic understanding. Where does the where do how do you see the loss of olfaction as a way to begin understanding what COVID is doing in the brain? So, if I may, um, part part of the answer will lie in prevalence studies that are done. Um, prospectively, not uh, from groups that are self-reporting. Um, and so it's hard to say what is the prevalence of co-occurrence of post-COVID brain fog and post-COVID anosmia and agusia or, di or, or dysgusia. Um, we at, at Columbia absolutely are collaborating with ENT. In fact, um, one researcher who studied post-viral anosmia before COVID-19 uh, and, you know, he has cohorts that he's interviewing. Uh, we absolutely refer back and forth to each other. And so we, we definitely have some patients that have persistent um, smell and taste dysfunction while uh, also coming in with prominent cognitive and mood and behavioral concerns. But um, on the same token, there are others who have had, had no perturbation in their taste and smell and have these cognitive concerns. Now, pathophysiologically, um, the reigning hypothesis is that it's the sustenacular cells in the nasal epithelium um, that you know, allow um, the uh, virus to enter through the ACE2 enzyme. And while we know that in other coronavirus models, like the murine hepatitis virus, uh, that there was kind of a retrograde um, uh, uh, um, travel of the virus to the brain, uh, it's much less clear. Um, it, you know, it's it's there's there's been shown to be um, some some changes in mouse models of even COVID nineteen, uh, but not in humans. Um, so because we don't see any clear evidence of a preponderance of um, viral particles uh, in the brain parenchyma, um, we we don't think that there's this kind of retrograde invasion in in humans. Um, but it is possible, and one of my kind of pet hypotheses is that there is a subset of patients with chronic inflammation in the olfactory bulb. There, there have been one or two case reports with like really, you know, really kind of astounding inflammation seen on MRI. But chronic kind of low-level inflammation um, that causes this persistent loss of, of at least smell, um, and uh, and then of course the gustatory receptors in in the in the uh, mouth as well. And is this contributing to a chronic neuroimmune change in the brain? I think that's kind of the, the million dollar question that hopefully, million, you know, that there will be dollars put towards to fund to answer. 
Walter, without asking you for dollars um, <laughs> directly, uh, what are your thoughts about olfaction and and uh, and and COVID? Anything to add here? Yeah, I, you know, I totally agree with what Anna said. Um, it's a little controversial still. There's a recent paper came out from Germany where they're claiming they do see evidence of virus going up, um, but a lot of other people can't find it. So I think we still have to wait for sure to know. Uh, there's definitely involvement of the sustenacular cells in the nasal mucosa. Um, that, that was done very carefully with single cell uh, analysis. Um, so I think relevant to this group, I don't, um, there's an investigator at NIH called um, Dorian McGavern. Hmm. And um, he has a really interesting paper. It wasn't coronavirus, but you know, he basically just studies viruses. And, uh, but basically what he finds is that there's a really robust um, innate immune system around the olfactory bulb, which gets activated probably, probably every day, <laughs> I'm thinking, you know, when things actually can get up. And, um, and certainly, you know, in Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, you know, if you think about it, certainly in Parkinson's, you, you really worry that that some pathology begins out in the periphery and moves into the central nervous system, the gut, the nose, Alzheimer's, you know, particularly the nose would be the place you'd look. So I think there's a defense mechanism out there to try and protect us and, and that we have not really examined, you know, its failure rate. Uh, and I think COVID is potentially one example. As Anna said, there is one case where the MRI lights up like a light bulb in the olfactory um, uh, in the olfactory bulb and, and the prefrontal cortex, and somebody who's in status. Now, how due to COVID? Now, how why do they have focal status in that area is disturbing. It's very unusual. So I think there is, yeah, I think there's a lot to learn. Uh, and that, so I want to go right to a, a pretty burning question from the question answer uh, function. Uh, this is from Violetta Chitu, uh, who asks, if these, co uh, if these cognitive and emotional issues are related to the immune response to SARS-CoV-2, how safe can we expect the vaccine to be? Yeah, so... Um... <laughs> The, uh, so the vaccine, you know, anytime you come out of a vaccine, certainly the thing you worry about is some kind of nervous system problem. And, you know, certainly uh, H1N1, we got Guillain-Barre as a bad adverse effect. The only thing I could say is that, you know, here I ask around Dr. Fauci and all his friends about, has anybody seen this or this with the vaccine? And so far they say no. And so they're up, you know, they're upwards of hundreds of thousands of people. Yes. So um, if something bad was, you know, there was a transverse myelitis question um, a couple of months ago. Um, I guess that was with the Oxford vaccine, mm -hmm. but uh, it's been pretty silent since then. So I think we got to keep our fingers crossed, but yeah, I mean, I think uh, I suspect there will be as there are with most vaccines a, a rare number of adverse events due to the immune response, but hopefully it's going to be, you know, less than one in a hundred thousand type thing. Yeah, I, I guess my take on it is that the phenomena that you guys have described seem to be pretty intimately linked to viral replication, which is not going to occur with the vaccine. Certainly we give vaccines in an attempt to stimulate the immune system. And we certainly know that there are uh, occasional and quite rare immune complications or things that were gonna happen anyway and happen to happen after a vaccine if there are hundreds of thousands or dozens of millions or hundreds of millions of people being immunized. But I think it's possible to dissociate the biology of the vaccine from the biology of the virus. The vaccine is only one 
subunit of the virus, not the virus. Right, but what you'd like to do is to look for any cross antigens yes. between the spike protein and neural proteins. Yes. And I don't think the companies did that. I've asked and no one replies. So I don't think they've done it. Um, Good point. Yeah, I, I will add that um, I think it's, a, it's an excellent question and it's one that we as a society have to address to make sure that we have um, a, you know, adoption and acceptance of this vaccine. Um, and, um, and I agree with, of course, everything that Dr. Kurschetz and um, Ron Sahaf have said. Um, I will add though that um, thanks to um, Dr. Rasaniello's TWIV, which I listen to religiously and would, um, ad I would uh, um, advise you all to do as well. Um, it, I have learned that in the vaccine trials, um, there are still some who get mild infection. Um, they just don't get severe infection. Wow. Mm -hmm. uh, and at least in one of the two, the two trials. And for me, that's actually the more important question is now have we primed our immune response enough to kind of smolder the flames of uh, you know, a, a, a larger cytokine storm, um, more of an endothelial dysfunction to protect ourselves from long COVID. Um, and I think it'll be, it'll be important to follow those patients to see what kind of um, response they have over time. But, um, and it may influence how people feel about, um, you know, kind of that, that step between when we, everyone first starts getting the vaccine and once we have some sense of herd immunity and, um, and SARS-CoV-2 is not so much you know, rampant anymore, um, do you still want to venture out and be one of those few who get a small infection um, and maybe it's better to just keep that mask on for a few extra days or, or weeks. Uh, I want to ask you another question, Anna. You called out something, uh, I think very interesting, about anesthetic response and, and the, the levels that are needed uh, to treat people. I think that was actually Dr. Kroos. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, actually. You heard that too. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, let's see what Anna thinks. Well. Yeah. Uh, so um, I guess uh, just to clarify, when you talk about anesthetic use in this context, you're talking about it in the uh, um, process of, of, of uh, having a person uh, use a ventilator for breathing. And so it's, a, it's a, essentially a sedation with paralysis uh, that's required to tolerate the ventilator. And you're saying that heroic levels of exposure are needed. Uh, so the question from, uh, again, fr from Alfonso, who made the nice comment to uh, Aaron, um, Alfonso Martin Pena, is, is the resistance to anesthetics selectively seen only during the acute phase, or has anybody reported it during uh, the sequelae of COVID disease that, that a uh, person might be resistant to uh, sedation for colonoscopy or something. Don't know. No, I've not heard anything like that, but I wouldn't, I don't think I would have, if, even if it was true. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I think All right. So it's, out. Acute. Yeah. so it's acute. Good. Everything we've heard so far is acute. Yeah. Good. Thanks. Uh, okay. Uh, you, have you heard that from Columbia folks too? And I, I definitely saw it acutely. Sure. We were running out of certain anesthetics right. after a while, but um, not in the post-acute phase. Right. But in the acute, yeah, okay. Uh, there's a guy called Jeffrey Rothstein, who I think is a postdoc uh, somewhere. And he says at Hopkins that uh, the vast evidence suggests that neurological issues are tied to vascular flow changes in the CNS which was following on from a uh, cytokine storm. And he says that would be predicted to have long sequela. Um, but what we've heard is that some mild cases also have the long sequela. Um, are, are they the same? Is there a, a kind of a, you know, really a post critical illness state that persists? Maybe with some, you know, what might have resembled the early um, uh, cardiovascular bypass pump syndromes um, with a microvascular injury as compared to the other 
complications you're talking about that would be seen in somebody who had a mild case of COVID. Yep, so um, I actually was just in an, uh, um, an NIAID um, workshop on post-acute sequelae where this was also exactly the question. Um, so I think we should distinguish between kind of the downstream um, neuroimmunological changes and why they're occurring. And I don't, I wouldn't disagree that, I would actually agree that it's the endothelial dysfunction or the vascular changes that then probably are, are what's, what are driving those downstream immunological changes. But then, you know, bringing us that one step forward to the vascular side, um, actually initially, um, kind of a, as an aside, when we were on the wards, uh, a, a neuroradiologist and I um, kept seeing these micro hemorrhages and we were even wondering like, is there a post capillary microthrombotic state in the venous system? Because there were these tiny hemorrhages and, you know, patients with delirium that um, that you know that had no no indications for it and that weren't intubated or anything. Um, I, I would say that nowadays probably the, the answer would be there's a subset of people who have cerebral hypoperfusion persistently, and I don't have great evidence for this. Um, I will say that um, uh, I think Eva Feldman at, at UMish has seen a lot of dysautonomia. Um, we have seen some as well. Absolutely, I've read with great interest, like Peter Novak's um, you know, one case report of uh, small fiber neuropathy and uh, kind of an orthostatic hypoperfusion syndrome that partially responded to IVIG. So, um, and, and we are doing um, as much kind of perfusion scanning as we can actually afford, which is not, not that much, but um, to the extent we can, I think, especially if a patient is coming in with orthostatic lightheadedness, or other signs of dysautonomia, like palpitations, early satiety, um, we constipation, we, we think about it, we think hard about it. Um, and I think it's absolutely worth investigating, but it's not everybody. I certainly have had patients who come in with uh, short-term memory or severe concentrational or executive function um, problems, and they don't have any of these symptoms. Uh, question. Well, Jeff's question is, um, people who had ARDS, they had long-term cognitive sequelae, so you, that's going to be expected. Mm -hmm. But in the post-COVID reports, there's some of them don't even see a difference between people who are ICU or just on the ward. And there's lots of cases now that have never been in the hospital. So the CDC report was all outpatients. It was no inpatients. So that you don't have to even get in the hospital to start have some of these longer term problems. Yep. Uh, there's a question from, I want to get the name, uh, Deborah Croteau, um, given association between olfaction and APOE genotype. Uh, has there been any look at APOE genotype and the susceptibility to CNS complication? Uh, so um, we at our ADRC um, under Scott Small and Jamie Noble at Columbia are, are trying to kind of backtrack and see which of the ADRC participants um, that we have actually are also in our COVID biobank. Uh, and um, you know, we'll, we'll have, we have or we'll have genotyping on those existing participants. We'll also have like pre-existing measures. Um, so uh, to that extent, we'll, we want to understand APOE and its impact, um, but uh, there hasn't been a direct collaboration with ENT on that side and there probably should be. I would just add one other thing from the, if there's any, any, any circuit people left <laughs> in the meeting, but so we've been trying to think about the neurology of fatigue for yeah. the last five or six years, and <clears throat> it's a complete morass. I mean, everybody feels fatigued at some point in their life, but what is the neurology? What is the brain doing that tells you, I cannot look at another poster, I'm going to kill myself, <laughs> you know? Uh, what, what is that, you know, just how does the brain make that decision and how is it affected by when you have an infection or a fever or you just haven't slept or, 
Um, you know, the kids have been driving you crazy all day. So this whole thing that I think one thing that's pushing us is to try and understand where in the brain, I think it's like thirst or anything else that there's some calculation that goes on in the brain that says, I've given up, I'm not doing this anymore. <laughs> um, and that, that can be toggled up or down and by, you know, interleukins or whatever, cytokines. But I mean, Richard, you took care of MS patients. There are there a couple, you know, fatigue is the big deal with the Parkinson's patients. Fatigue is a big deal, and we have no clue, you know, where in the brain this is coming from. Yeah, I, I strongly second that thought. Uh, so, uh, as Walter mentioned, I, I worked at a multiple sclerosis specialty uh, uh, research and treatment center for 30 years, and so I took care of MS patients over long periods of time. Uh, fatigue is is an extremely common. Uh, report from MS patients. And uh, as, as a clinician, what you learn to do is, is track down the usual suspects. So are they anemic? Are they hypothyroid? Are, those are sort of number one. Number two is, do they have a sleep disturbance, either because of depression or because of uh, bladder issues that get them up five times a night, or occasionally because of a, uh, um, a phenomenon of, of spasticity called extensor spasm. So sleep disturbance uh, is another problem. Uh, depression with or without sleep disturbance will lead somebody to report fatigue. And then the last sort of usual suspect issue is around the uh, the kind of just energy output that it takes to get around uh, if walking is impaired, but you still got to, you know, walk and do your stuff. You got to go do your job. You got to do stuff around the house. So once you dissect away all of that, you have a population of patients and it is not at all small. Uh, and they have primary MS fatigue, as it's been called, and it remains rather mysterious. Uh, there are some hints of signals on functional MRI, uh, thinking about circuits that might be associated with MS fatigue, uh, and there are hints of, um, as Walter was suggesting, involved. Uh, uh, selective atrophy of certain brain regions uh, that can be associated with MS fatigue. It's not an area that's progressed very rapidly in recent times. Thinking again about some, some of the ways that we try to get clues about these conditions, one gratifying feature of MS practice is that occasionally you will give a patient a medicine, and the one that has been used widely in the MS community is uh, amantadine, uh, which is, came in as a Parkinson drug and might have a little bit of, of uh, NMDA receptor activity and so forth, uh, and um, is, can be a miracle. And uh, the way you find that out is about, you know, Half of the people you give it to, when they run out of their prescription, you don't hear from them. The other half will bang your door down to renew that prescription and keep it going. Uh, and they are having a real response. And that's, it's a, it's a biological agent. There's some clue there as to how this works in some individuals. So uh, I, think it, I think the phenomenon of fatigue is, is all about neurobiology. And, and probably circuit dysfunction. Yeah, and Dr. Dr. Ratzel, I've, I've actually had similar thoughts and experiences borrowing from the MECFS knowledge base okay. um, of amantadine and dexmethylphenidate and also from Parkinson's inattention and fatigue um, as a potential treatment. Um, also, people have reported ADHD type symptoms that can also be treated with this, even migraine. Um, I want to add 
Jamie Noble would want to add that cognitive intolerance is a term in the post-concussive world that yeah. has been used to describe the, you know, this very same syndrome. And we, we know that um, you know, that is probably um, one of the most kind of uh, structural um, and you know, an easy to pinpoint type of injuries. And, and we do see the same kind of mental fatigue um, present there. I will also make a plug for the fact that um, MECFS guidelines recently changed um, to no longer recommend CBT and no longer recommend this gradual increase in exercise as a solution, you know, as a, as a first line treatment. And I would say we're, we're making sure to learn from that and realizing that patients who are suffering both types of post-exertional fatigue should be instructed to take significant breaks. Um, and, you know, and it's, it's not really just about buckling down and fighting through it. So that's an absolutely perfect sequela to the fact that we should probably wrap up now. We have 10 minutes before the next session. So um, let's take our foggy brains and clear them out. And I really want to thank the panelists for their participation. I want to thank all the people who were here and especially those who said nice things about the session and sent good questions. I would encourage the panelists that there are a number of questions we didn't get to. Uh, so have a look at the Slack channel. That's where they go to. That's where, that's where questions go to hibernate until you respond to them. And so one more time, thank you very much. Uh, and let's get ready for the next session.